Saskatchewan. Start somewhere inside its borders, pick a direction, and you can drive for hours without ever leaving. A land as vast and varied as its rich history. It doesn't matter where you begin or where you end. It doesn't matter if you're moving or standing still. The place will come to you. It will whisper to you. It will tell you stories. It's a place full of stories. Stories of culture, stories of survival, stories of accomplishment, and stories of people. It will capture your imagination. It will become a part of you. It will move you. Challenge is often celebrated as an obstacle overcome, a barrier made passable through the intervention of will by men and women. Challenge speaks to us in riddles, it teases us with mystery, it's fun for a while, it brings out the best in us, but can also be devastating. It can bring death, fear, and despair. Challenge can often be the very thing we would shun if we had any other choice at all. At Paradise Hill, the only sound in the fall of 1918 was the sound of a young man digging graves. His father and mother, they were both killed by the epidemic, plus his three sisters. He was the only survivor, forced to dig graves for the whole family. Towards the end of World War I, in 1918, Canada faced a new enemy that would ravage the country, Spanish influenza and it was brought primarily by discharged soldiers coming from the trenches of the First World War. And it made its way slowly across the country from Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, Regina, and then it moved north by train to Saskatoon and other areas. Spanish flu is an upper respiratory tract disease that often leads to pneumonia and then death. There was no known treatment or cure for this strain of influenza. The most common victims were young people in the prime of their lives, and it seemed to be a tremendous blow to the nation at a time when it was celebrating the end of the First World War. The disease caught the country by surprise. Saskatchewan, like everywhere else, was unprepared for the crisis, and the healthcare system was overwhelmed. As the flu worsened, most people were cared for by family members or volunteers. And at the time, there was an expectation that women were natural caregivers. So men who did volunteer to help were told often to go home. Spanish flu was extremely contagious, and many people caring for the sick were soon infected. At Emanuel College here that was an emergency hospital during the epidemic, of the 15 women who began nursing, within a month, six of them had died from the flu. To protect their cities, many towns resorted to desperate measures. Small towns, thinking that flu must be brought by strangers, began to quarantine themselves against the world. Their towns would not allow any trains to stop, and if the trains stopped, no one was allowed to get off. People also tried using folk remedies, such as placing onions about the house or eucalyptus oil. One of the popular remedies for influenza was alcohol. Now, of course, alcohol was legally unobtainable in Saskatchewan since the province had adopted prohibition. It was possible, however, to obtain a prescription for alcohol for medicinal purposes, which you could then have filled in a drugstore. As it turned out, the safest place to be was on an isolated homestead. But as stories of the epidemic spread, people moved to villages, often with devastating effects. There had been a couple of cases where homesteads were found fires out, the homestead covered in ice, and the occupants all dead for some weeks. And this had a huge impact on people's imaginations. And often they fled then to the safety of villages. When they came into contact with other people, it heightened the chance that they would get the flu. The peak of the outbreak occurred in November 1918, when a record 2,500 people died in Saskatchewan. 
The war and the epidemic were very linked in people's minds. So as the war ended, there was an expectation that the epidemic would end as well. And this reinvigorated the epidemic after the 11th of November in 1918. So people who had previously been careful and tried to avoid flu victims poured into the streets the night of the armistice. Worldwide, the Spanish influenza claimed the lives of 22 million people, twice the number that died in World War I. In Saskatchewan, more than 5,000 lives were lost to the dreaded disease, touching every family and community. At the turn of the 20th century, tuberculosis, often referred to as the White Plague, was the number one killer in Canada. Tuberculosis is a highly contagious disease caused by a bacterial infection, most often affecting the lungs. Until the 1950s, there was no known cure other than bed rest and fresh air. To combat the disease, Saskatchewan, like many other provinces, built sanatoriums for diagnosis and treatment. The Fort Capel Sanatorium, also known as Fort San, was built in 1917. The clinic's first doctor and administrator was R.G. Ferguson, who moved on to the sanatorium grounds with his wife and family. The house we lived in was right at the top of the sanatorium, and from there you could see most of the sand in a beautiful location. My mother was a nurse, so I grew up under very strict conditions. <laughs> when we came in the house, the first thing we did was to wash our hands. Before meals, we washed our hands. So the, the chance of getting tuberculosis was certainly minimized. Life at Fort San was carefully structured and monitored. Depending on their condition, patients were prescribed a strict regime of bed rest. The ones that had severe tuberculosis were in an infirmary, and most of those patients didn't get out of bed. To cope with the monotony of their routine, patients found activities to busy themselves. The girls would do a lot of crocheting and whatever. A lot of them do a lot of reading and leather work. They do a lot of this leather work, making wallets and handbags for the ladies, eh? Fort San housed up to 510 patients. The average stay was just over one year. For some patients, though, Fort San was home for much longer. We had a patient they call Archie Boyd. He was a barber from Assiniboia. That man, he laid in the sanatorium for 15 years. And then when he got drugs in time, he walked out on his own power. The discovery of effective medication in the 1950s led to a decline in the number of patients. By the 1960s, incidences of tuberculosis were so low that Fort San closed its doors. But the Saskatchewan Summer School of the Arts took over the facility. Over the next 30 years, thousands of students studied music, drama, writing, and the visual arts. For almost 80 years, the institution of Fort San had been at the heart of Fort Capel, preserving lives, art, and building community. Challenge is. It just is. There is no motive, no agenda, no reason for it being, really. It just comes and stays until we overcome. Water is wet, the sky is blue, and challenge will always be. Challenge can tear our lives apart and take everything away. And it can make us stronger than we ever thought possible. It was a very hot, very muggy day in Regina. A lot of people were down at Wascana Lake swimming at Owens Boathouse and other places along there. The mayor was entertaining some important guests from out of town. He spent the afternoon driving the person around town, showing him the sights. June 30th, 1912 started out as just another summer's day for the people of Regina. But at 4.50 p.m., disaster struck. A massive tornado swept through the city. The friend of the mayor's looked out his window and saw the cupola from the top of the Baptist church rolling down the street. And he just as he spotted that, somebody came pounding on the door and said, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, your city is blown away. What came to be known as the Regina Cyclone gathered in the southeast, destroying many farms on its way to Regina. 
The tornado's funnel was about 400 meters wide, and it was moving fast, up to 60 kilometers per hour. The tornado roared through Regina's residential neighborhood, then devastated downtown. Next, it tore through the warehouse district, hurling boxcars through the air. In a newly built city of 10,000, a quarter of the population was temporarily homeless. Property damage was estimated at over $1 million. We also had problems with this, the Regina Public Library building, and it had just been completed on the 15th of May. And here it was, the 30th of June, and the top roof had been just peeled right off. Many buildings were never designed to withstand a tornado. The nature of the construction of buildings in that time did not anchor the floors well to the walls. And so these walls ballooned out with the pressure and the weight caused the floor to collapse. While the damage to buildings and property was overwhelming, the tornado claimed the lives of 28 people. On the south side of Regina Public Library, in the lane there, a couple died by the name of Blenkhorn. They had been married in April and were supposedly supposed to take the Titanic on its journey to the New World and had been making merry on their honeymoon and had missed their boat. And so they had arrived on a later boat, came to Regina, and yet their lives were met with this. And they were killed with bricks that were dumped on them. Over 200 people were injured by the storm. Despite the tragedy, there was some humor to be found in the aftermath of the storm. One of the funny ones is the fact that the Department of Education provincial final exams were all stacked up on tables waiting to be marked starting on July 2nd. And the windows of the ledge on the east wing popped out with the air pressure and sucked out all the exam papers. Cleanup crews began working immediately after the cyclone. Within hours, the telegraph was reconnected and power was restored. However, it took over a decade to completely rebuild the city. Some of the buildings that survived still bear the marks of the biggest storm ever to hit Regina. It was all gone in four minutes. In four minutes, it just swept right through. It's sort of a landmark event, and legends have grown around it since. Challenge can also be used as a tool, a means of expressing objection to a wrong. It can be the hopes and dreams of those who evoke it. Challenge, a stab in the light, a tactic used in a battle of wills. The Cypress Hills, located in southwest Saskatchewan, has always been a sacred place, a gathering place for the First Nations people. Among these First Nations was a group of Cree, led by Chief Nikonit. It was the late 1870s, and the Canadian government was trying to move all of the First Nations people out of the Cypress Hills. They wanted people away from here because it was too close to the American borders. It was just the aftermath of the uh, American Indian Wars, and there were still large groups of uh, tribes just south of the border, so they didn't want any uh, collusion of anything of that time. Despite government pressure, Chief Nikonit and his people chose to stay. The government responded by denying the Nikonit people assistance they were entitled to under Treaty 4. The Nikonit people refused to back down. Despite hard times, they found ways to be self-reliant. It wasn't until the turn of the century that Nikonit's people were officially granted land. His 1,440 acres was allotted to him as a reserve in 1913, but he didn't get to see that. He passed away two years previous. I think the real hardship was more or less after the fact when the lands got settled through the Homestead Act and when the province came into being because there was uh, very harsh restrictions on uh, Indian people. They really had to get permission to even step off reserve land. Although the band had an official reserve, they received no assistance from the government. In one way, this was a blessing for Nikonit's people. They were excluded from any residential school push of the day. We still speak Cree fluently. They were able to retain their religious beliefs. In 1976, the Canadian government finally agreed to pay the Nikonit people their treaty benefits, nearly 100 years after first signing Treaty 4. Then in 1992, the band became the first in Saskatchewan to sign a modern treaty land entitlement agreement which increased their land base by approximately 28,000 acres. If you were to look at the land and drive through, you'll find that it doesn't really have any agricultural value in terms of the production value. You know, it's all hills, coolies, and 
and dams and whatnot, but the spiritual essence of that is invaluable. We have to try to protect that. He was very strong in saying that treaties don't make nations. It's nations that make treaties, and that's what happened here on this land. That has to be understood. John Tatusis was born on the Poundmaker Reserve on July 18, 1899. His grandfather was Yellow Mud Blanket, Poundmaker's brother. Tatusis's ambition was shaped early in life after a serious illness. He was dying of typhoid, and in order to survive, he'd dedicate his whole life for his people if he lived. That was uh, the driving factor in his life, his oath to the Creator. In 1920, Tatusis was appointed chief of his band. He was not yet 21. The Department of Indian Affairs at the time were not the only opposition to his uh, activities, his actions, his agenda. I think, though, that kind of uh, resistance served to make him more determined. During the late 1920s and 30s, Tatusis worked for the League of Indians of Western Canada as both president and secretary of the Prairie Region. He traveled throughout the province endeavoring to organize a united voice among the First Nations. In the mid-1940s, three provincial First Nations organizations amalgamated to become the Union of Saskatchewan Indians. Tatusis became the first president. February 24, 1946, I believe, was the, was the first meeting. And he had tremendous input and involvement in, I guess, galvanizing and getting the people together and expressing the need to have one organization to represent the treaty position. In 1958, Tatusis's dream of a united Indian voice was realized when the Federation of Saskatchewan Indians was formed. Again, Tatusis served as a first president. He wanted to change the, the way of life for the people because of what, the abuses that went on in the residential schools. They, he strived to get schools within the reserve, they called day schools, which we could go to school every day and come home. And he was a major player in all Indian high schools and universities, and he accomplished that. He, they eventually got them all. In 1970, Tutusis was appointed to the newly formed Senate of the Federation of Saskatchewan Indians. He focused on protecting treaty rights. This work, along with others, led to the entrenchment of treaties in the Canadian Charter of Rights. For his tireless work on behalf of his people, John Tatusis received the Order of Canada in 1986. He passed away three years later, leaving a legacy of accomplishments. I just have so much uh, tremendous respect for him because of not only what he tried to do for the people, but also for the sacrifice he made and knowing that the people before him also really relied on him and that he delivered in the best way he could. The challenge of politics is simply to survive the challenges of your opponents. To not only survive, but then thrive, is a whole other challenge. To rise from humble beginnings and become Prime Minister of Canada, nearly unthinkable. Mr. Diefenbaker's life is part of the history of Saskatchewan. He was the only Prime Minister of Canada to come from Saskatchewan, and he was part of the ongoing growth of Saskatchewan and its people. John George Diefenbaker was born in Newstad, Ontario in 1895. When he was eight years old, his family sought a fresh start and new opportunities in Canada's untamed West. They came out here by train in 1903, uh, two years before Saskatchewan became a province. And they homesteaded like thousands of other Saskatchewan pioneers. Diefenbaker was educated by his father and uncle in a one-room schoolhouse. His studies included a book about Sir Wilfrid Laurier, whose story influenced the young Diefenbaker's destiny. Mr. Diefenbaker, at an early age, decided that he was going to become someday the Prime Minister of Canada. Diefenbaker attended the University of Saskatchewan and went on to study law, but his education was interrupted when he volunteered to serve in World War I. After his wartime service, Diefenbaker completed his law degree and set up a practice in Wauwakaw. Mr. Diefenbaker was known throughout Saskatchewan as a very good lawyer and gained a national reputation as a very famous criminal lawyer. He was elected leader of the Conservative Party of Saskatchewan in 1938. He continued to work towards his goal of becoming Prime Minister by running for leader of the Conservative Party. He lost the leadership race in 1942 and 1948 before finally succeeding in 1956. The following year, Diefenbaker campaigned for Prime Minister. He appealed to the average Canadian. 
farmers, factory workers, and shop owners. Mr. Diefenbaker gained a reputation in his later years as being a champion of the underdog in Parliament and to hundreds of Canadians he's known as the chief because they knew that he would speak out on behalf of ordinary Canadians. Diefenbaker's empathy for the common Canadian was rewarded. In 1957, John Diefenbaker became Prime Minister of a minority government and one year later, he returned to the polls to win the largest majority government in Canadian history. It became known as the Diefenbaker Sweep. Mr. Diefenbaker was the first non-British or non-French Canadian to become Prime Minister of Canada. He also was a very patriotic Canadian who believed in strong national unity. One of Mr. Diefenbaker's most notable achievements was that he was the author of the Canadian Bill of Rights, which later became the Charter of Rights under Prime Minister Trudeau. Diefenbaker extended his agenda of equal rights with the political appointment of James Gladstone to the Senate, the first Native Canadian to hold that position. First Nations people were also granted the right to vote, and the Diefenbaker administration also appointed Ellen Fairclaw, the first female federal cabinet minister. Diefenbaker was also a champion for Western Canada. The Diefenbaker government went out of its way to sell wheat to China and India, opening up huge markets for Saskatchewan farmers. One of his more prominent ventures was a South Saskatchewan River project. The Gardner Dam was a story of good relationships between the federal and provincial governments. The lake was named after Mr. Diefenbaker, and Saskatchewan got an incredible project that has served the people well. Diefenbaker's term as Prime Minister ended in 1963, and in 1967, he was defeated as leader of the Conservative Party. Diefenbaker continued to represent his riding in the House of Commons until his death in 1979. In total, he had served in Parliament for 39 years. The challenge of human beings versus nature is a story as old as time itself. It's a great story one with many sequels. The story just keeps getting better and better with time. The Gardner Dam, a key component of the South Saskatchewan River project, was just an engineer's design more than a hundred years before it was finally built. The Gardner Dam is the largest earth fill dam in Canada and it's still one of the largest ten in the world. The South Saskatchewan River project got a start probably in the mid-1850s when the British government commissioned Captain James Palliser to conduct a survey of the area. It's what is known today as the Palliser Triangle. Palliser believed the area wasn't worth developing, but the idea of taking better advantage of the South Saskatchewan River continued to be explored. Finally, the combination of population pressures and the drought in the 30s convinced officials that creating a more reliable water supply in the prairies was a project worth undertaking. 1944, the Right Honourable James Gardner, Federal Minister of Agriculture, allowed for a feasibility study to study the feasibility of building a dam. Prime Minister John Diefenbaker and Premier Tommy Douglas struck a deal to fund construction of the $120 million project. This site where Gardner Dam is, is located right now was, was picked due to the topography, the river valley shapes, and the materials for construction were available mostly at this site. Although the location of the dam seemed optimal, the engineers soon discovered a problem. During excavations, some of the subsurface foundations started moving, so the design of the dam was changed during construction. That's one of the reasons it took upwards of eight years to construct. Before 1967, when the dam was finished, less than 1% of the South Saskatchewan's river flow was being used. Today, the lake, created by the dam, is a resource for the province. Power generation from this dam contributes to about 5% of the province's needs. It's a 187 megawatt generating plant. It's a realization of a vision that started 140 plus years ago. It's a story of success for the people of Saskatchewan. It was memorable. A project which amounted to a mining operation in the middle of a city and in the middle of a cold Saskatchewan winter. In November 2003, a fleet of heavy equipment moved into downtown Regina and began to excavate the frozen bed of Wascana Lake. Folks called it the Big Dig. For the next five months, the people of Regina would line the shores of Wascana Lake in all kinds of weather to watch the equipment work. 
They were fascinated by the spectacle of 24 gigantic hauling trucks, eight bulldozers, nine excavators, a fleet of support vehicles, and a crew of 92 work around the clock seven days a week to complete the job. It was unlike anything they had ever seen or ever will again. The project was of paramount importance to the people of Regina. There was daily coverage of the dig in the Regina Leader Post, the local TV stations, and several dedicated websites. But it was more than simple curiosity that kept the project on the minds of Regina's citizens. Without the big dig, Regina would lose its lake. Wascana Lake was filling in with sediment, goose poop, and decaying plant matter. The lake had developed a rather notorious reputation for its bad odor in the spring and thick growth of weeds in the summer. Within 50 years, the lake would become a marsh. The only thing that would save the lake from itself was to dig it deeper, much deeper. Before the big dig, the average depth of Wascana Lake was one and a half meters. The dig would increase it to five and a half meters with a portion of the lake dug down to seven and a half meters. This would create a new habitat for fish that could then survive through the winter months. The big dig would also stem weed growth, which in turn would keep the bad odor at bay. The idea to deepen Wascana Lake in the winter of 2003 was not a new one. The lake was formed in 1883 when the CPR dammed Wascana Creek at Angus Street to create a reservoir for steam locomotives and cattle. The citizens of Regina quickly began to use the new body of water for recreation, but the same old problems would always seem to surface. The lake's shallow depth would spawn weeds and odor. In 1931, a Depression-era make-work project called for the lake to be drained and deepened. The fill from that project was used to create Willow and Spruce Islands. Later, a 1962 study determined that the lake would need to be dug even deeper. The costs of such an operation, however, were prohibitive. Millions of dollars were needed, and it was not until 2003 that the money was found for the project. But the wait was worthwhile. After the project was completed, the lake became more popular than ever. The 2005 Canada Summer Games were held in Regina, and a beautiful new Wascana Lake was featured prominently to a national television audience. The crown jewel of the Queen City. Challenge. You can use it. You can meet it. You can overcome it. You can count on it. In Saskatchewan, challenge has always been a presence an accent hidden behind the voices of the stories being told.